We're certainly very privileged to have Kevin Brad with us today. He's many things. He is a scholar, he's a deep thinker, he uh, was a politician, uh, he is a reformed diplomat, poli reformed politician. Reform politician, hopefully better politician. He's a diplomat and also he's a linguist. He has been twice prime minister in Australia. He is uh, currently the uh, president and CEO of the ASEA Society. And he's going to Washington in a couple of months to become the Australian ambassador to the United States at a particularly exciting time uh, in the world. Uh, and he's also a prolific author. And he has written a marvelous book about the relations between the United States and China that I would recommend you to read because I'm in the midst of reading it, which is called The Avoidable War. And I think that's something which is really very, very useful to understand what may be going on. So, Kevin, thanks very much for being with us today. It's good to be in church with you, my friend. Wonderful. So, okay. Free evangelical church. So um, we're going to evangelize trade, are we? Okay. So may globalization be with you. Mm. Okay. Good. So let me start shooting some questions. Um, and the first one is about wh where are we nowadays in terms of uh, globalization. Are we seeing, how pessimistic or optimistic should we be? Are we seeing that globalization is, is backtracking or is it just evolving? There are some people who think that globalization is, is condemned to death and there are others who think that it's just changing, changing shape. What are your views on that? I think it's changing shape and that's because the fundamental drivers of globalization remain, which is that international ac economic activity and national economic wealth increases the more that there is trade and the more that there is international financial engagement. Uh, and that is not just a piece of theory, that's a, the, the lived experience of the world community for some decades now. Now, of course, the reaction to that, as we all know from um, society and from politics is, uh, how do you deal with winners and losers in that process, both within local communities and nationally? And I think what we're now seeing is a readjustment of politics to deal with how do you more effectively deal with those who, um, as it were, are disadvantaged on the process on the way through. I do think we'll end up at an equilibrium, uh, which is perhaps not full-blown neoliberal globalization, uh, the one which was uh, launched with great fanfare in the 1980s, uh, 90s and into the first decade of this century, culminating in the global financial crisis which ultimately became something of a report card on untrammeled globalization to something which I would now characterize perhaps as an evolving form of social democratic globalization where you have some conditionalities about the poor, conditionalities about those who have to transition in work, uh, and those countries uh, which are finding it uh, difficult in the process as well. So I'm in the latter category, which is it's an evolution of the globalization project. Okay, and I very much agree with that. So the reports of the death of globalization are grossly exaggerated. I They're the agree. same as Mark Twain. Exactly. Who said the same after he'd read his obituary in exactly. one of the American papers. Wonderful. Um, now let me go a little bit deeper into the issue. And we're seeing a lot of uh, discussion around global supply chains and there are things that are happening. We hear about onshoring, reshoring, um, French shoring, but also uh, there is the possibility of international diversification of global supply chains in order to achieve resilience. Mm. So I wanted to get your views on what, 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 what do you think it's, it's happening and um, where is this going to lead us? Well, this all became dramatic for the international community in 20. 20, 2021, uh, with, the, with the unfolding pandemic. And suddenly, various national jurisdictions around the world found it very difficult to manage the supply of PPE, uh, the supply of basic pharmaceuticals, etc. cetera. Um, and so as a consequence, it generated in many of our countries and societies national debates about the need for, quote, various forms of national resilience and national self-sufficiency. Um, certainly in terms of how you wrestled with a pandemic. 
And that then genericized into a broader debate about national self-sufficiency. Uh, at one extreme of that argument, you see the national self-sufficiency argument writ large uh, in the People's Republic of China, where the national discourse within China is increasingly in the direction of national self-sufficiency. Uh, other countries are seeking a more diverse approach. So where does the balance lie with this and the evolution of the globalization project? It will be, I think, national jurisdictions reaching core conclusions about what is fundamentally necessary to survive their societies at times of international duress, uh, and for therefore there to be an intervention in local markets to achieve that, and leaving the rest of the, as it were, economic process to the normal forces of globalization and comparative advantage. I think that's where we're up to. So you are going to see, therefore, uh, nationally driven supply chain uh, adjustments, um, and the real uh, complexity will lie in the definition <coughs> between the essential and the non-essential mm -hmm. uh, in surviving societies during times of duress. Okay, thank you very much. Now let me come back to something which is critical to understand the future of globalization, which has to do with the relations between the United States and China, an area where you have uh, very uh, insightful uh, thoughts. Um, how do you see this relationship going forward? And what, do you, what, what would you recommend to international companies, global companies, like the ones here present in Davos, which do business both in the United States and in Asia and in China, in terms of how to best navigate the challenges coming from this difficult relationship, but also take advantage of the opportunities that may emanate from it? Well, it's a bit analogous to the uh, debate we've just uh, referred to on globalization more generally. Um, the pessimists in the, uh, in the room would say globalization is dead. Neither you or I agree with that proposition. The pessimists in the room would also say that we're now in a process of unfolding Cold War between China and the United States, which will inevitably lead to total economic decoupling. <coughs> that, again, doesn't reflect reality. Uh, it's a much more complex reality than that. If there is a decoupling which is likely to unfold, it will be in certain defined areas of tech. Uh, of course, leading that charge is semiconductors, question mark uh, uh, where we go to with quantum computing, question mark where we go to with artificial intelligence. Uh, but that is quite different from a genericized reality which says we're going to have total decoupling between the world's largest and second largest economies. I cannot see that happening. So where do multinational corporations fit within this? Um, I think if you're in the tech space, and particular sectors of the tech space, then it will be a question of being very diligent and careful about navigating your business case in terms of whether you're likely to fall foul of either A, China's national self-sufficiency guidelines for its own technologies uh, against its own ind industrial plans, or B, the emerging national security-driven technology export bans to China from the United States, already starting with categories of uh, semiconductors. If you can navigate that, then I think you still have an opportunity to run global businesses. But beyond those particular narrow areas of tech, uh, and I don't diminish their significance, there is still no compelling argument that these two economies are destined to split. In fact, if I read carefully the Central Economic Work Conference report from Beijing from December 15, uh, what it is doing is writing a very large chapter which says uh, China is fully back in business, fully wanting to integrate itself with the international economy, welcoming foreign direct investment in all categories except these defined technologies. So firms will have to become literate about where, frankly, the parameters lie, but if they can navigate those parameters, then there's no reason why they can't prosecute a business involving both US, Chinese, and European markets. Yeah, and I think that in addition to what the political actors may do, I think that global companies, we also have a constructive role to play in terms of establishing bridges and connection points between our clients, you know, in the United States, in Europe, in other parts of the world, and in China, 
so that you know, by doing our business in a professional manner, we can basically help them and help uh, both parts of the equation, both the advanced economies and emerging markets, which are there. So thank you very much for that. Um, as president and CEO of the Asian Society, I wanted to talk a little bit about other countries in, in, in Asia. And there is another very large country in uh, Asia, which is, uh, which is India. Mm -hmm. And um, India is large. It's uh, you know, growing quite significantly at present, and good expectations also going forward. And I wanted to ask you about the role that you see uh, uh, for India in terms of the geoeconomics and the geopolitics of Asia and beyond. My own judgment is that uh, India, under Prime Minister Modi, has decided to uh, fundamentally internationalize the Indian economy. And there's been enormous domestic resistance to this project for many decades. Uh, for example, when I was Prime Minister, I, mean, I remember launching a free trade negotiation between India and Australia. It took more than 10 years to conclude and was only concluded recently um, uh, under Prime Minister Modi. But now you see the Indian government engaging in FTA negotiations with the Canadians, with the Brits, with the European Union and with others, which a decade ago was simply not conceivable in the Indian body politic, which was quite closed and quite protectionist. So the Modi administration has concluded that having lost out to the economic race with China over the last 20 years, when China surged ahead, is now looking at this carefully and saying India's time has come, and looking therefore to the role of international capital, international markets, and domestic economic reform to turbocharge the Indian economy into much higher levels of growth. And so far you see the early signs of some success of that. I think the last thing to say about that is that New Delhi is deeply mindful of the opportunity also which its hosting of the G20 this year offers it to rebrand itself in the eyes of the world, my words not theirs, as the next China, mm -hmm. um, but particularly to say to the rest of the world, we in India don't present a geopolitical challenge for you. And therefore, we could become reliable sources of supply to global supply chains in the future, in whatever categories of manufacture. And secondly, to also say to the world economy, we're also greening. And there's a huge project which Modi is leading into the G20 summit at the end of this year about the green transformation of the, of the Indian uh, energy system, mm -hmm. uh, relying upon not just solar, but the future of green hydrogen as well. Yeah. Terrific. Let me now uh, turn to China, the other sort of uh, very large economy in Asia, one of the two largest economies in the world. And now, you know, China has been going through certain difficulties. Now it's experiencing a, experiencing a COVID wave, but hopefully that will be over soon. And here in Davos, the, you know, in the air, there is the idea that, and I think it's a founded, a well-founded idea that China's recovery would be very strong in the second half of the year, and that would be good for the global economy. But beyond the short term, looking at the medium term and taking into account all the geoeconomic and geopolitical factors, how do you see the role of China in the global economy? Well, by definition, China's economy is huge. And the real question is whether it grows in the future at three or four percent or five or six percent uh, per annum. At this stage of its economic development, it should be five or six. Uh, but for some years now, it's been slowing and it's um, uh, quite independent of the COVID dynamic and the COVID phenomenon. So the real challenge in Beijing is, will they have all the policy settings in place in order to maximize growth back to around six? Uh, for example, exiting from zero COVID, it's been an untidy process. Uh, zero notification to the public health system in China, um, a large number of deaths among old people right now, um, but by the second quarter, assuming no further adverse variation to the virus, Omicron, then the, the projection internally is that by second quarter you'll start to see robust economic growth numbers again and acceptable levels of casualties, though being a Communist Party state, they're not going to publicise how many people actually died. 
Second thing, though, is ideologically, the Chinese Communist Party for the last five years has sent out a range of negative signals to the Chinese private sector. Uh, the property sector, the tech sector, beyond that, private enterprise more generally, a common prosperity agenda uh, about uh, mandatory wealth redistribution, etc. But what I've seen in the Central Economic Work Conference at the end of last year is them again seeking to signal quite dramatically a return more to the market with a series of quite deep changes. The question for the Chinese private sector, which represents 60% of GDP, is will they believe these changes and reinvest? Or will they see the possibility of an ideological return to a more statist approach to the economy again? So that's a big question mark. And the third one affecting China's growth performance is the role of net exports in China's growth. Partly that will depend on whether the global economy recovers and whether there are going to be robust markets abroad for Chinese goods and services. So that's a question mark as well. But I think you're going to see a post-COVID boost to growth in 23. Uh, question mark about the policy shifts that have occurred. But you will see some contribution from property and tech and recovering consumer demand. Question mark net exports. But if you were to look at 23 and beyond, 5.5% growth is the projection for this coming year. I think that's reasonable. Uh, and given where the world is, that would represent some two thirds of global growth mm -hmm. for 2023, which is no small thing. Right, great. Okay, I think that's, that's terrific. Thanks very much for sharing your views with us. I share your uh, positive outlook for uh, China and India that having these two big emerging market economies being important drivers of growth in Asia and the world, I think that would be uh, very important for everybody over the next uh, you know, few years and perhaps beyond that. So thanks very much, it was a pleasure. Good. And I think that we should uh, say goodbye and thank you to Kevin Brad with a round of applause.